How's it going, guys? Welcome. As you can tell, I don't have uh, Bethany here, so I can do all the talking. I'm very excited about this. All right, welcome to Ask a Puppy, Ask a Puppy Trainer Show, episode 58. Wow, it's exciting. That's a lot. All right, guys, and you know that you can submit questions online the day before, the week before, whenever you need to. You can also throw some questions in the chat. Looks like I have about maybe five questions to go over. Obviously, I could make that talk for two hours or we can go through them pretty quickly. So depending on how fast we get to them, we might even be able to answer some questions in the chat. So feel free to throw them in there. All right, without further ado. So this is from Daphne. Hi guys, questions about Ask a Puppy Trainer. My, my dog Rocco, my male Basenji of six months, is really a gossip dog. He loves watching other people and dogs when they're at the park, not the dog park. He sees dogs and he sits and just kind of watches them, see what they're gonna do, but he doesn't do any more engagement than that. So the question is, if another dog comes slowly or is trying to approach us, many off-leash dogs in the area, then Rocco goes full puppy mode and jumps to the other dogs and stops listening to me if I say a command for going slowly. I've been trying to make him more, trying to get him to focus on me more, and I use treats on the walk when no one is around. But as soon as there is a change on that, all is lost. How can I modify this behavior? Okay, so I think the key word of that question was modify. So food work doesn't modify behavior. Food work positively reinforces the behaviors that you already see that you already want. So let me answer the first part of that. If I have a dog approaching, your dog is a threshold. When he hits that threshold, that's when you lose him. And I know threshold is door, but there's another version of threshold. That's like the brain threshold. You have dogs that work under threshold, which means that's when he's sitting there watching, kind of checking everything out. As that dog gets closer or the distractions get stronger, or even the stimulation gets bigger, he starts working up of his uh, stimul he, he starts working up towards that threshold. When he hits it, that's when you lose him. That's when you lose focus and it's really hard to gain that back. So you need to do even more practice under threshold. That might mean work inside your home. That might mean work in your front yard or your front walkway area. You see a dog coming along the pathway or walking along the sidewalk, right as Rocco builds up his drive, you add a little bit of leash pressure, you say come, you show him the food, and you guide him away in the opposite direction. If he doesn't look at food, he doesn't take the food, he doesn't smell the food, that means he's already above threshold, and that means you're not ready for that yet. If you guys are still struggling with that, and you do actually wanna do modification work, that's where you modify behavior, you do probably need to hire a private trainer, and then go over some uh, basic training tools to help you get a little bit more focus. But yeah, normally you have to work a dog below threshold, build them to the point to where they can see a dog get as close as possible, and then there's always gonna be a wall, because if a dog is off leash and is trying to play with them, is jumping on them, there's no way to get Rocco to not jump back and not play with him because that dog is actually invading his space. You could even try advocating for his space when the dog approaches, talk to the owner, hey, nope, sorry, we're training. Please don't let your dog approach. Can you put your dog on leash? Most parks are in our area at least. They're not off-leash parks unless it is a dog park. And usually people tend to be pretty respectful of that, especially if they see that you're working your dog. As that dog approaches, you could even try moving away from the other dog and working them below that threshold so he doesn't surpass it and he doesn't cross it. Hopefully that answers your question. Try it out, let us know. Get back to us next week. All right, Serenity Sweethearts. How to teach a nine month Bernese Mountain Dog not to pull on a leash? It answers it in the exact same way I just did for Daphne. You gotta start teaching them inside your home, backyard, front yard, walkway and then sidewalk in front of your house. You're doing a lot of food work. You're basically using your meals on your walks as well. Take that meal, if it's like kibble or if it's like wet food, you can do a little plastic bag in your pouch, put all of it in there and take the food out. Always have at least a treat in your hand at all times. You need to find a point to where he's able to work without becoming distracted. And you do hundreds of repetitions of he blows ahead of you, dog come, right when he looks to your food, good. Give him the treat, move in the opposite direction. Walk 10, 15 steps, he starts pulling ahead. Dog come, good, treat, turn. Move the opposite direction. Back and forth, back and forth. The goal of this is at one point, you're gonna be walking and your dog is gonna be watching you, looking forward, watching you, looking forward. These are check-ins. He's basically checking in to see what you want from him. That's when you know you're ready for the next level. If all of that is in your living room, up and down your hallway, and he's watching you turn, and you're not needing as much food to create that turn, he's turning with you and following, try the backyard. Get him to that point, try the front yard. Get him past there, try the sidewalk in front of the house. Oop, now he's pulling and not focusing on food. Pull it back, go back inside the yard. 
You gotta just find what he's capable of doing. As he gets older, then you can push him a little harder. But a nine month old, that's an older dog. That means that you can be a little bit more pushy with them. You can be a little bit more firm. So when the dog does pull, you can kind of give like a little leash tug, go the opposite way. And if they're still not paying attention, you might be at that window to where he's kind of past that puppyhood. Because a nine month old is an adolescent dog. Whether it's male or female, doesn't really matter. But it means that they're more willing to push the boundaries that you've set. You might need a private trainer to come in there, show you a couple different training tools and how to bring that focus and get you a little bit more leverage. So I know that's a, kind of a similar answer to Daphne, but nine month old dog, that's the only difference is six month old versus nine month old. Six months is just starting the adolescence phase. Nine months, you've been in the adolescence phase for a while. So you're gonna have to try to find a way of building leverage with your dog. Alex Jennings. Uh, quick question for Wednesday. Our four month old cattle dog mix is very rowdy at night. The witching hour. I love that. Is, oh, the witching hour is 10 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. first. He bites us all over, breaks the skin, and hardly listens to commands. He listens to commands pretty well during the day. We say, ow, we disengage, we're stern, we offer him his favorite toys and bones. Nothing works for very long. I feel like we're, tr we're trying all the things we've read online. Our last resort is putting him in the crate for a timeout. Any other tips? So I already know what Bethany would say. She would say, putting him in the crate doesn't deal with the issue at its source. It kind of just puts it off. But I know there are times where it's just challenging and you kind of have to put it off. But let's talk from a couple different angles. Let's answer the first part of that question. 10 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. for us, most of the time, a young puppy, four month old, oh gosh, four month old especially, that dog should already be in the crate. I usually say, find your, so get him on a structure schedule. You can DM us and we'll send you one. And normally I'll say, the nighttime crating is if I get that witching hour 10 p.m. to 11.30, I'll do his last crate time between, I don't know, maybe 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. For a four month old dog, you're probably doing about two, two and a half hours in the crate. 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m., do a 30 minute to an hour training session with them if you're able to, and then put them back in for the rest of the night from that 10 p.m all the way to when you're ready to wake up, whether it's 6 a.m. or 8 a.m., or eight a.m. You know, probably 6 a.m., you're probably only about eight hours out of them, and that should control some of that energy a little bit better. But all the other times where he's breaking the skin, hardly listens to commands, you're, during the day you say ow and he kind of disengages, so sometimes the ow can actually build drive. With little puppies, their screech is so loud that it might disengage the other puppy to do it. But for a human, humans usually make it seem more like play. And if you turn your back, it might even make him a little bit more pushy. I implore you to try using a leash. Put a leash on him. Anytime he's out of the crate, have him put on his harness, put a leash on the harness. And when he starts getting nippy, grab the leash and do my three strike roll. Strike one is a firm no with the redirect, whether it's toy or actually doing training. Most of the bitiness is just over energetic. He's got too much energy, he's got too much stimulation. Work through that stimulation by working the brain or work the brain with the toy and do really slow movements with the toy, get him really bite at it so you're at least redirecting away from the hands and then after a couple seconds, try to let the toy go, see if he'll self play. The other end of that is do training. Go grab a handful of kibble and see if you can work him through that energy. But I'll be honest, sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes strike two kicks in and strike two is gonna be our addressing it. That means firm no, grab the leash, lift up and kind of move into your dog. You have to invade their space to see if they're gonna back off. You might even need firm pressure up and extend out those arms to kind of lock them out and keep and get some distance. Move in with your legs and do like little bumps with your legs and invade his space. Claim his space as if it was your own. And by doing that, you're showing him, hey, back off and settle down. There's a moment where when you hold that leash pressure and step in where he's gonna fuss, fuss, fuss and slowly kind of stop, lower the arms slowly as well. A quick up and a quick down might build drive. A quick up hold, slow down, brings down the drive. He might settle or he might come at you again. If he does, lift up, rinse and repeat until eventually he's ah, taking a breath. But don't turn your back, don't take a step back. You always have to move forward and show them that you wanna be in charge of that situation. You wanna be the leader that kinda of helps them understand what he's supposed to do in that situation. But honestly, if even after all of that, strike three, he's still not understanding, still jumping, still biting, still getting crazy. That kinda of comes down to the 10 p.m. to 11.30 for me, to where he might just have too much stimulation, too much energy. He can't help himself, take a deep breath. That's not for him, that's for you guys. And that's to regulate your own energy. Cause now I want you to calmly grab that leash, pick him up if he's small, or guide him to his crate, 
put them in, take off the harness and leash, close the door, latch it, cover it, turn on your little white noise machine, and walk away. But I know some of you are thinking, but Sparky, crate can never be a punishment. Everything we research online, and you've done your research, I see that. Everything we've researched online tells us that we cannot put the dog in the crate in a bad way. What the no can't do it. And you're right, it's how you put the dog in the crate that makes the negative experience. If it's bad dog, no, house, and we put him in there, he's like, whoa, that was scary. And that creates that negative association. But you gotta think about it this way. Dogs don't rationalize in the same way that humans do. So he's not sitting there being like, oh, well, mom put me in the crate because I was nipping and I'm in trouble and I, I ended up in the crate, so that's a bad association. It's all energy. It's all energy, my emotions, and what I show him. If I take that deep breath, that's to calm myself down. So by the time I walk him over there, it's just neutral. He goes in there, he's sitting there like, huh, what the heck was just happening? I was biting at mom and I know how much she loves that and then I end up in the crate. All right, well, I guess it's nap time. There's no negative association, there's no punishment, there's no no, it's just you have too much of something, I can't help you with that. I put you in the crate, you settle, you relax, you eventually go to sleep, a couple hours later I bring you out. It's like don't wake the sleeping baby and if you have a baby that's overtired, crying all the time, the more they nap, the more regulated they're gonna be. So you just have to help them understand what you want in the moment, go through your couple steps, your, three, your two strikes, third strike, pop in the crate, let them settle, let them relax. Okay. Cassie Middick, Cassie. Questions for the Ask a Puppy Trainer video. Four month old mini golden duel started to bark. What do I do before he gets out of control? He barks to get our attention. If he's contained in his area and we are somewhere else. Okay, so going off the assumption of the area is that his crate or the playpen. If it's the crate, honestly I'll kinda of just let him bark it out but I also have to think about where my crate is. If the crate is in the living room and there's a lot of foot traffic, we live, we our business is on the PCH which is like a really, really busy street. If I put a dog crate in the living room, it's like me taking my sleeping bag to the sidewalk and trying to take a nap out there. Car traffic, foot traffic, there's just way too much going on. He won't be able to rest and relax. Try putting that crate somewhere quieter. If you have a guest bedroom, you have a human bedroom that gets used very infrequently throughout the day and it only gets slept in at night, that's usually the room that I put the crate and that will help him settle much quicker. Because dogs aren't just about what they see, it's what they hear as well. If we have a cover, we have like a towel or a cover over the crate, you have a white noise machine, if he can still feel the footsteps, hear the footsteps right next to him, he's probably gonna be a little bit more frustrated, he'll bark at you. Try putting that crate in a calmer area, quieter area, and it should help him sleep and relax a little bit more. But let's talk about if it's the playpen. If you guys have followed our schedule, you see that your free time window is put a playpen or some kind of back tie in the living room in the area that you're in. If you are in that area and you have to leave that area, if it's just a quick opportunity to go potty, like go use the restroom, you can stay in the playpen. He barks for a few minutes, no big deal, you come back. But if you're gonna leave that area for a longer span of time, we don't wanna keep him in that playpen because that's where he gets himself into trouble. Take him out of the playpen, put him back in the crate or put a leash on him, tie him to your hip and then bring him with you. If you're still getting the barking after that, you can even do like a three strike roll for that. He comes to the edge of the or comes to the edge of the playpen, starts barking at you, step in, kind of bump the playpen a little bit to back him off. No. Sit, good, grab a toy, redirect him to the toy, and just kind of let him go with the toy for a little bit. He barks again, second strike, firm no, move in, and just kind of stand in front. When he jumps up on the playpen, give the playpen a little bit of a bump kind of bump him off it. We don't want to do it so hard that he falls back, just to kind of get him to settle down. He sits, he waits, good, try to disengage. Third strike, he can't handle it, pop him back in the crate. Most time I'll tell people that anytime you're doing a free time window, so let me, let me make sure I'm not digressing too much. So when he's getting out of control, he barks to get our attention, even in his contained area. My question is, did he get enough mental stimulation before going into that contained area? My free time window is three parts. Part one is walk and play, part two is training, part three is supervised separation. The walk and play means that I'll take a toy and I'll do constructive play. I'll do fetch for five minutes. I'll do a 10 minute walk around the neighborhood, slow with a lot of food work. I'll maybe do five, 10 minutes of training. If my puppy's mental stimulation is up here, like just out of this world, he's not gonna be able to settle down in the playpen and it's almost unfair for us to ask him to do so. So I either have to physically and mentally or both stimulate him so when I finally put him in that playpen, it's 
calm time. When he's in the playpen, I don't give love, I don't talk to him, I don't touch him, I don't even look at him. We're just in two separate planes of existence. Even though I'm in the same room, I'm teaching him how to exist around us comfortably and confidently. So we're literally building self-confidence, independence, and the ability to exist without having access to us. That might even cut down on some of your barking too. And let me ask you this too, are we giving a lot of affection? Are we holding them in our arms on the couch? Are we petting them? Are we loving them? Are we carrying them all around the house? So then when it's time to put him in the playpen, he's like, are you crazy? I just got all this love. Why would I go in the playpen after getting all this love? So I think pull back on some of the affection you're giving, maybe do a little bit more training, a little bit of calmer play, constructive play to get the brain working, but also get some of that energy out and then try the three shark while he's in the playpen. Okay. Oh man, I don't do well without Bethany. I need all, all the like side talk and all the side questions. You guys throw, throw questions in the comment section. I'm gonna finish early. I don't even think we've ever said that before. All right, this is from one of our YouTube videos from I believe a couple weeks ago. So this was from how to stop your puppy from sniffing on walks. And this is from Robert. Nice ways to, in question form, nice ways to re prevent and train a dog not to sniff on walk, but how to stop them when, is this saying how not to do that or? No, it's, they're good, he's saying they're good preventative and how to train a puppy not to do it, but what do you do to stop it when they're all? Gotcha, gotcha. So if anyone got a chance to watch our video, it was different ways to prevent and train a dog not to sniff on the walk, but Robert is asking, how do I stop a dog when they're doing it? All caps, stop. I understand the training and preventing so they won't even start doing it, but how do we stop them from when they are doing it? Do we let them sniff until they're tired and ready to proceed with the walk? No. Or do we pull them by force? My five month old used to walk nicely, but then his scent sense, scent sense became stronger and he makes an hour out of a 15 minute walk. Robert, I feel ya. Um, are you gonna pull the leash a little bit by force? Not really, it's more of just a redirection. So if I have a dog that is walking and his nose is glued to the ground all the time, pulling forward, I'll stop and I'll actually take a step back and create a little bit of tension on the leash. We're not pulling them by force away from the smell because all that does is make you into a crutch. We're actually helping communicate what we want from them in the moment by creating tension and waiting with our piece of food gradually build up the tension more and more and more and more until eventually it pulls him away from the smell very gradually he kind of looks up at you food is in front of the nose dog come good treat walk the opposite direction away from the smell and i do that four or five times back and forth until i'm able to get that focus but robert you might even have even have to ask yourself has my dog matured, hit a new stage of development and maybe even doing that won't work you might have to take a step back I take steps back with my dogs all the time. I have a dog that walks amazing, but certain times of the year when the smells are a little bit stronger, her nose is glued, I'll literally take a step back and I'll just do food work on my walks or I'll use like training tools that I've done with other trainers and other things in the past. That might even be another option for you, hire a private trainer to help you get a little bit more of that focus. But I would say either prevent it, train him through it, or when his nose is on the ground, take a step back, create tension, Gradual, gradual, gradual. The minute he looks up, dog come good. Treat, turn the opposite way. You might need to get better rewards on your walks or even hold off on feeding them until that walk. If I have a 7 p.m. walk and I usually feed dinner at five, I might hold off on that 5 p.m. meal and I might use that meal in my training pouch on my walk on the same side that he's walking. So as I'm walking and I see something that might look like a smell, pull out my food, put it to his nose, walk him past it, bubble around, good treat and then maybe circle back and pass it a couple times in a row. One of the times he does go for it, the minute his head goes down, I'm already stepping away, creating leverage, a little bit of leash pressure. He eventually looks, dog come, good treat, heal, and then start walking again. So I'd say that preventive, the reason we stress that so much is because for a young puppy, three to four months old or even four to five months old, a lot of what you're doing is preventative. If their nose is already on the ground, you've lost that moment. On the, first, on the very first question of this live, I talked about being above threshold. When a dog is above threshold, there's not much you can do. And if you're definitely going down the positive reinforcement only route of using food, you have to build bigger food drive. There's no free walks where he's gonna spend half the walk smelling. I don't even give a single opportunity for him to smell. And if I have a lot of smelling on one walk, I'll stop. I'll head home and I'll use the sidewalk in front of my house to go back and forth to build up that food drive, to build up that food response. So instead of me constantly fighting my dog to get focus, 
I'm expecting focus because he wants to give it to me. If a walk becomes too challenging, just may not be ready for it. Ricky, do we have any other questions? No, but can you clarify something or talk clarify. about the difference between pulling back on the leash or attention on the leash pulling down the spine versus to Oh, the I side. love it. I love it. Okay. So whenever we create tension on the leash, what Ricky asks is there's a lot of people that will pull the leash back, almost like it's going straight down the spine versus kind of going back into the side. So when I pull a leash with my arm, I'm even gonna go a little bit farther into that. We're gonna deep dive it. So when I pull the leash with my arm, when I pull with my arm, a dog feels tension, but the arm moves. It's not this indomitable object to where when you pull on it, they don't feel any like change in resistance. So when I do my pressure back, I don't use my arm, I use my entire body. And if my dog is pulling to the side, I'm not pulling back down the spine, I'm actually going to the side of their neck or to the side of the harness and I'm stepping back with my whole body. When I step back with my legs, my legs are a lot stronger than my arm, it creates a constant pressure they, that they honestly cannot battle unless they're big enough and strong enough, then you have to definitely hire a private trainer. But you wanna to move to the side, create pressure so it gives you leverage so they start moving more easily towards you. And then when you get the focus, that's when you walk back and that's when you're with food. But yeah, if you move down the spine, that's like trying to push a linebacker. There's no way they're moving back. They train their whole lives just to be as strong as they can in a forward motion. Dogs are built to be as strong as they can in a forward motion. Push them from the side, they're gonna fall like a leaning tower of cards. What else you got? That's good. That was it. I think I just combined two references. You did. I like it. That's, that's who I am. All right, guys, any other questions? Uh, TikTok, anything? Wow, I don't think we've ever ended early. I know. It's so exciting. Wow. All right, guys, we'll be here for a few more minutes. So if you have any more questions, throw them in the chat. Otherwise, good to you guys. Thanks for joining us. Let's see if I can pull any more information out of any of these questions. Of course you can. I always can. Okay, let's go back to uh, Alex Jennings' question. Let's uh, go more into the owl. So we say owl, we disengage, we're stern, we offer him his favorite toys and bones. Oh, we have a question after that came up. Okay, we, we have enough time for both. We offer him bones and nothing works for very long. So you guys are going from multiple channels. When you say owl, that's you trying to kind of go from like the mind of the dog, which is the owl and they'll disengage, but then you're also very stern. So if you're gonna give an owl, or give an owl, an owl, an owl and still be stern, take out the owl, just say a firm no. Most of the time, a dog understands a no better than an, than an owl because we can empower a no more. We can use that leash pressure, no, lift up the leash, move in firm, but then also don't redirect with the toy. You need to use body language to create control and almost create that leadership role. I won't use a toy because usually in that situation, I'll try to use food to redirect my dog's focus. So when I give that firm no, lift up leash, step in, grab my food or grab my pouch and put it on, then I'm gonna to try to redirect to a training session. And I won't reward them right away with food, I'll try to work them for two or three minutes and really kick in that food drive so they're watching and instead of them trying to bite or jump, they're being more respectful with their body language and after a couple of minutes of doing that, then I'll start rewarding them with the food. I don't wanna reward the bad behavior. If I say no, step in, they back off and sit, I say good and I treat, they're like, oh, jump, sit, food they might try that more often. They might try to jump on you and sit and get more food again. So anytime you're gonna use that owl, make sure if you're gonna use the owl, it's a pure redirect. But my preference would be use a no, strong body block, leash pressure if you have it on. If you don't, I recommend you put it on and then wait the dog out. And if you can, turn it into a training session. All right, what's our first question? Okay, two questions. So first one is, I have a puppy that constantly chews wood items at home. She has plenty of chew toys. How can we work her away from this habit? Okay, so do you have an age for me? A watch, can you repeat the question many times? Since I'm not late? I can, you gotta scroll back up. Yeah. Okay, this is from... R-L-L-S-L. I have a puppy that, that constantly chews wood items at home. She has plenty of chew toys. How can we work her away from this habit? So honestly, I don't see the age, but I'm guessing probably like four to six months, something around there. If I have a dog that's chewing wood, I would say that they might have too much freedom in the house. And I know, constant thing, that's, that's what we're always preaching, structure, because a dog that is chewing something, they need more preventative. The reason we preach preventative is because instead of always yelling no at your dog and correcting them and redirecting them, it's just easier to have them on a leash. Even if they're just dragging a leash around, 
I start seeing them go for the wooden area that's been chewed, the baseboards, I'll pick up that leash and I'll just put it on my hip or I'll hold it and I'll redirect them away from it. If I have an area that has a lot of toys, 10, 15, 20 toys, and they're all in the area, most dogs will actually get overstimulated from toys. If she has 10, 15 of them, or even like maybe five to seven of them, she plays with each toy individually, gets bored, and looks for new things. I actually corral all my toys, I put them all away, and I give one or two toys at a time, maybe every three days or so. I take those two toys at the end of the three days, and I give two different ones. It almost makes it so like every new toy they get every couple days is a new experience and is a new toy for them. So one preventative, don't give them access to the wooden area. If you time your hip, grab a playpen, whatever you guys need, be more preventative than anything else or limit the amount of toys that you give and then just give a couple new toys every few days to keep the interest high in the toys. And if they're still going for it, gotta get a playpen, gotta tether them to something, gotta do like a back tire like time to your hip. Just too much freedom, gotta cut down on it a bit. Right. Next question. This one I'm gonna off on. Leash walking, how long should we practice for? Our puppy is five months. Okay, so leash walking, how long should we practice for? Our puppy is five months. So five month old dog, honestly, you could probably be walking about 15, 30 minutes. I don't know what kind of dog it is. If it's like a bulldog, you're doing like five to seven minutes. But if it's an Aussie, it's a shepherd, it's a golden retriever, whatever it is, that means you can up it a little bit. But again, your walks don't have to be out and around the neighborhood. Your walks can be pure food work. It could be in front of your house. It could be backyard, front yard, sidewalk. It could be at a park along a pathway that isn't heavily frequented or even off to the side on like maybe like a little bench area with concrete just so you can keep the focus. But yeah, you basically just want to work the brain more than the body. If I have a dog that has two wells, physical exertion well, mental stimulation well, the physical exertion well is probably a hundred times bigger than the mental stimulation well. This is physical exercise. This is mental exercise. If I walk my dog for 45 minutes to an hour, I bring this well down to here, it drops down and they sleep for 10 minutes and it's back up to here. But if I train my dog, this 20% well goes down to 5% and it stays there for two to three hours. That mental well doesn't fill up like the physical does. So you can literally do five, 10 minutes of training with your dog on the walk, maybe even 15, 20, get them home and they're likely to sleep for a couple hours if given a stationary job like a playpen or a play scot or put back in the crate. So I'd say 15 to 30 minutes and if you're training, maybe cut that in half. You'll, you'll wipe them out really, really quickly with that. Great. What else we got? Question. How do you train an eight month old Great Pyrenees with two indoor cats? She's been around since eight weeks old, but she wants to chase and I'm not sure if she will hurt my cats if I let her. Leash, she probably won't hurt them on purpose, but she'll probably jump on them thinking that they're dogs and probably not gonna end too well for you. Uh, you just gotta use a leash and no free access. Uh, usually what I'll do too, and I know Bethany would preach this because she always does, is your cats need to have an out in every single room that the puppy is. So if cats are in living room and dog is in living room and you have the dog on a leash but you may not be able to catch it every time as quickly as you want, you're, you gotta have a couple different cat trees. You also have to condition your puppy. Did you say Dane puppy or Great Pyrenees? Uh, great Pyrenees. Big dog, okay, so Great Pyrenees, you need to condition to stay off of the cat tree. So when dog goes to the cat tree, pick up leash, Great Pyrenees come, good, food, place, sit down. You gotta be able to redirect them away from the cat tree so the dog learns how to respect the cat tree as the cat space. Or even just a standard ledge, you can do anything really, just to help them understand that the cat always has an out and the dog has to respect the cat space when they choose to use their out. Well, is that it, we got one more? Hey, we did it, okay. All right guys, thanks for joining us. Wow, it's a lot of work without Bethany. I didn't realize how much she talks in this. Same time next week? Same time next week, guys. All right, um, 12 Pacific. One o'clock Pacific. One o'clock Pacific. My brain's done. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. Bye.